awesome chat is brought to you by sidekick media services we are your sidekick in business for social media video production and more find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com and listeners like you support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast Hey guys, this is the Awesome Chat. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on Twitter here. Uh, the show where we talk about people doing awesome things in and around the Pittsburgh area, and today is no different. Uh, please, uh, before we get to our guests, please check out everything Awesome Chat on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, as well as uh, Google Play Podcasting and video versions on the YouTube and the Facebook page for the Awesome Cast. You can check out all the previous interviews and all the other shows we do at awesomecast.com. Stay tuned to that Facebook. We have uh, events usually when we get our, uh, our our guests. You never know when they're going to pop up here. And uh, you can drop into the chat and get notifications when we go live as well. My guest today is somebody that uh, I got the, uh, the the pleasure to meet through uh, Tunzium. has been a great supporter of some of our projects like Chachi Plays for Kids. Uh, through that organization, he's on his own. He's doing great things right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to finally have him on the show. I've been trying to get this guy for a while. I'm glad I got a place to... To, to, to have him in here, Joe Wos joining us here, illustrator extraordinaire. Thank you, thank you. It's great <laughs> to be here finally. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so, like I said, we, you know, I f- first met you, you know, through the Tunesium, but I know you've got to have like you know more history with you know, you're, you're, you're a lifelong you know, cartoonist and mm-hmm. everything. Give us a little bit of your background, like what you know, what, what all have you been into? So, so I started drawing um, when I was four years old. My parents caught me drawing on the walls of the crayon. Um, and, uh, rather than yell or scream or get mad, they tape paper up on the walls and said, go ahead. And I've been drawing ever since. Um, I started drawing professionally, uh, as a cartoonist getting paid to draw when I was 14 years old. Uh, I grew up in North Braddock and Braddock, uh, area of Pittsburgh. And, uh, I started drawing at church festivals, caricatures, things like that when I was about 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got my first copyrighted character when I was about that age, about 14 as well. And, um, so it, it's been a lifelong passion. Um, when I turned 20, uh, I went to the children's museum of Pittsburgh and said, um, you know, I, I, I love to draw. I'm, I'm not really doing much with my time other than drawing. Um, why don't I come down here and I'll, I'll just draw for kids. You know, they'll come up to me and say, draw them a turtle, draw a chicken, draw whatever. And I would draw their favorite animals. Um, and that's really how I got it started sort of on the sort of, you know, divergent, more interesting path. Um, than just sort of your traditional cartoonist. I've always sort of pursued things that have been sort of a unique twist to cartooning. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started doing that, just drawing for kids. And then uh, I noticed I would have kids come up. They'd say, draw me a turtle. And I'd start drawing. And they'd go, what's the turtle's name? And I'd say, well, his name's Fred. They go, well, where does he live? And I go, well, he he lives down in Turtle Creek. You know, And 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 they started to ask these questions. And before I knew it, I was telling stories Mm -hmm. and that sort of uh, a light bulb went off. And I said, that's, that's my, that's my niche. I'll, I'll become a cartoonist and storyteller. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did for, for a very long time and continue to do. That was sort of my first foray into sort of full-time cartooning was on stage drawing stories as I told them in in the great tradition of, of vaudeville chalk talks. Um, I, you know, I consider myself sort of a a vaudevillian more than anything else. And that, that was sort of my first sort of introduction to the museum world. Um, that was sort of my first, you know, foray into full-time professional cartooning. And it was, um, sort of a unique experience. And so that's that's really where sort of the origins of a, of a lot of my history with Pittsburgh begins is at the Pittsburgh Children's Museum. Children's Museum, and, and of course, I, I came across the Museum, and I believe at the time, at least it was getting out there more. Like it was a pretty new concept. It was it was a, it was a toon museum, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the way the Museum came about is I had been at the Children's Museum for twenty years, over twenty years. So in um, two thousand and seven. Um, Actually, backing up a little bit, I, I had gone uh, um, when the um, Charles M. Schultz Museum opened in Santa Rosa, California. I was invited to be their resident cartoonist for their opening week. Um, I was a huge fan of Schultz. I had been teaching cartooning workshops for years, and someone had seen me and asked if I would come out. And I've been going back there every year since. But I, I fell in love with the Schultz Museum. 
And then I went down to San Francisco for a few days and I, and I saw the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And again, I just went, wow, this is, this is something unique. This is something unique I should try and bring this to Pittsburgh. Was the Schultz Museum mostly peanut stuff? Yeah, yeah. The Schultz Museum is mostly peanut stuff. The Cartoon Art Museum was much broader. Yeah. And so I wanted to bring this uh, to Pittsburgh. And so I, I approached the Children's Museum. I said, can I have a hallway? Mm-hmm. All I want is a hallway to transform into this Toonsium gallery. Mm-hmm. And to their credit, they said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and try it out. Hey, we, hey we have a hallway. We, we have a hallway. <laughs> I actually had to convince them which hallway would work. And there was a sort of one dark hallway that, you know, no one went down. And I don't know, it was haunted. I don't know what the deal was. But this one hallway in the Children's Museum. And, you know, we added new lighting and added, a, you know, a um, uh, uh, some frames and artwork. And boom, it was the Toonsium. Uh, did that for a year or two and then uh, decided to expand. And uh, looked around, and we we ended up moving downtown, and um, and that's sort of when the Toonsium took on its own life. That's when it became the Toonsium, its own entity, and uh, it was one of uh, I think only at the time it was one of only three cartoon art museums uh, in the United States. Wow! You know, uh, you go to Belgium, you go to Europe. I mean, Brussels alone I think has eight cartoon museums. So is it is it a um, like? Do they just kind of see cartooning in a different way in those cultures? Yes. I, I mean, cartooning in European culture, particularly sort of Belgium, especially um, France, certainly, um, it is considered high art. Italy, uh, another great example. You know, cartooning are considered, you know, it's, it's high art. Um, one of the great examples I, I like to give is um, when talking to, to someone who is from Brussels, uh, I, I said, you know, do you have, you know, your... I think the guy was 40 years old, uh, about my age. And I said, uh, you know, do you have comics in your home? You know, do you, do you read comics all the time? He says, to me, he said, to me, that would be like asking an American, do you have a television? You know, this idea that who wouldn't have comics in their home? Um, it's a, it's entertainment. It's educational. It's, it's literature. It's art. Why wouldn't you have? Them? Wow. Versus here, it's kind of a geeky thing. Yeah, it's it's yeah. considered a geeky thing. For the longest time, it was considered sort of a juvenile thing. I guess it still is in many ways. America does mm-hmm. have that that stigma of being juvenile. Um, yeah, the very adult comics is still I don't want to say a niche, but it's not kind of broadly it, it's not broadly thought of until they become movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and even then, I think people aren't even aware that exactly. sometimes they're not exactly. aware that Road to Perdition or, you know, or even Walking right, Dead, there right. are people who have no idea those um, are comic books, which uh, is astounding. Recently, uh, legal, uh, not Legally Blonde. That's a different. <laughs> um, Neon Blonde. Yeah. I, I'm like watching this, like based on the book, this, and I'm yeah. er, uh, Valerian. Yeah. And I'm just like, wait a minute. These are all, yeah, yeah. These are all graphic novels that we're seeing. Sure. And they're like the most interesting, not the biggest hits, but the interesting movies of the yeah. summer. Yeah. And I, I don't think Wanted was one. Um, I think Kingsman might have been too. Yeah, Kingsman was too. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about something like Valerian is is the, the it's a you know comic that is extremely popular in Europe mm-hmm. and the film just sort of you know didn't do well in the United States. I, I, again, you know, we one, have a hard time. Uh, America has always had a hard time bringing things from outside of America mm-hmm. without wanting to just completely redo it. Right. as their own you right. know and 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 i think we need to be a little bit more open-minded as to you know seeing the culture and the art that is you know around the world is going hey this is some great stuff like we bring in ghosts in the show and here's Whoa. scarlett johansson yes we have to. that's exactly what that's about yeah we have to americanize <laughs> everything so um so and it seemed of course had growth to you know i know i know you know doing touchy plays there we enjoyed the comfy couch side and the uh uh, and the uh, the the uh, I can't remember his name. The Phil, uh, the Lou Shimer, Lou Shimer Gallery, which was a big thing for me because I grew up on He Man. Yeah, and yeah. to see like He Man cells on the wall was really like, oh, this is really really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, and it was and it was a great experience for me too. I mean, mm-hmm. I I really enjoyed my time at the Tunzium. Uh, I was there for seven years. You mm-hmm. know, I, I was the founder and executive director. You were the guy. You were the Tunzium guy. I watched it grow. And, <laughs> yeah, and 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 then it 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 came time to you know seven years of hanging other people's art on the walls. Right. And I I put my whole life on 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 hold, sort of. While I did this, and you know, I invested all my personal savings, and it's a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So that that money's gone. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like oh, this is something I expect a return on. No, it's I knew what I was doing when I did it, and um. I donated probably about 
sixty percent of my personal collection wow. uh, to the Tunisian before I left, um, which formed the foundation for their collection. And then um, when I decided it was time to go um, back to sort of pursuing my own stuff, um, I knew I had to make a clean break. Um, not just for myself because it, it really wouldn't be fair to whoever the next director was going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. The current director, John Kelly, is great. He's doing a great job there. But it wouldn't be fair if I was still involved on the peripheral because um, it, it was just, I was casting too large a shadow um, in a positive way. Because, because well, it was your but, baby. You know, but it, so. but it, was, it was mine and it was always going to be identified as mine. Right. And it's not. It's, it's Pittsburgh's. Right. It belongs to the community. And it was a hell of a foundation. I think they're doing, uh, it looks like they're doing fantastic things even since you've been gone. Yeah, yeah, so. they've done some fantastic exhibits since they've been gone. They've, they've done some great programming. Mm -hmm. um, they're running along. They they did downsize. I know they lost the Lou Scheimer Gallery, which, you know, is uh, unfortunate. But, um, you know, that's that may be a good thing. It'll give them time to sort of, you know, regroup and, and hopefully they'll grow again. Mm -hmm. um, but they're doing, doing great exhibits. Yeah, I know it was a great thing. I know for us it was an inspiration, I think, for, you know, when we were kind of starting the Chachi Place things. We, we did part of a, a different organization, and yeah. then we're like, or for kids, that's that's something different. That's people can get behind. Yeah, yeah. And so many are not doing that, and it, it feels so important. Like we, always, I, I think at the time it, there were a lot of stories about schools are killing their, their music programs mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and that's why we kind of reinvested in that that side of things and can partner with you guys uh to, to try to you know bring some attention bring some money to these organizations yeah yeah and it's and it is so important i i mean I, my i've spent a lifetime in classrooms you know mm -hmm. just teaching cartooning to you know traveling around the country just um doing assembly programs and workshops and um i currently actually i teach a cartooning program at central catholic high school um that i teach every day during the school year um so you know arts programs are so important but i i think cartooning as an art form is uh, especially important because it's so accessible. You know, um, Snoopy is recognized in more parts of the world than the Mona Lisa. Um, that's not to say it's better art, although I think it is, um, but it is to say that yeah, it's... Art is subjective. It's, it's more accessible. Yeah. It is more accessible to all ages, to j just everyone. Mm -hmm. It really is. That's great. Um, so talk about like what, you know, you talk about, of course, you're teaching, of course, and I think you're representing a little bit of what you've been working yes, on over yeah, there. If yeah, you're on the yeah, video, yes, the dog likes it. If you're hearing him in the background, <laughs> uh, Wicked Wick is, 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 is enjoying this interview. Uh, but, uh, you know, tell us, so, so from there, like what was kind of the first step for you to get into? So, um, I, I sort of had this, this vision that there were some things I really wanted to accomplish in life. Um, I, I wanted to publish some books. I and, and I had probably, you know, the the unattainable dream of every cartoonist um, to become a syndicated cartoonist in newspapers. And is that? Um, I mean, the industry is different now, right? With newspapers and such, yes. and syndication. Yeah. Like, is that as a attainable these days as it might have been? No, or? it's it's actually gotten much less attainable. <laughs> it was already unattainable. <laughs> To become a syndicated cartoonist <laughs> in newspapers, it, it became virtually impossible. To give an idea, um, the number of newspapers has shrunk substantially. Mm -hmm. and there's still thousands, but there used to be many, many more. Mm -hmm. Circulation numbers are down, but um, people still read the newspapers. I mean, and the funnies is the part they read first. Yeah, I mean, there's certain parts so, of the country they're not going to change, and they're going to have their newspaper. Yeah, yeah, and and so you know, every cartoonist who you know loved Peanuts growing up, loved Calvin and Hobbes growing up, that's sort of the dream. Um, but it is the, the impossible dream. Um, the, there are, you know, five major syndicates, you know, really, you know, just a handful. Those syndicates receive tens of thousands of submissions every single year. Jeez. Tens of thousands of submissions. People, I want to be a cartoonist. I want to be a cartoonist. And of those tens and thousands, each syndicate may pick between two and five a year to say, we're gonna try this out. I was gonna say, like, like I know I opened the Pittsburgh Gazette, okay, sparingly, but, but like I feel like it's like all oh, these are the same people that are here and, like twenty and that's, years ago. That's the problem is there's these legacy strips that have been around for 50, 60 years, oh, okay. twenty years, thirty years even, and you know they they just 
keep running them. Um, the hell, Peanuts is being rerun. Peanuts is being rerun, and I love right. Peanuts. And um, but you you can't you know you can't disrupt you know you can't get rid of Mary Worth because there's there's um, a massive amount of little old ladies who will write letters. And demand you bring back their Mary Worth, or they're going to cancel scriptures. So, so there's a very limited space, mm-hmm. very limited number of people who are being accepted into into the the industry. Um, I, I've heard story after story of I've been trying for 20 years to get. Oh. I submit every year, and I heard this over and over and over. I knew it was the impossible dream, um, and I didn't have a niche. I I. I I looked at creating a comic strip and I thought, I just can't do this. Mm-hmm. Come up with something funny every single day, develop all these characters. It's I, And it's all been done. I mean, it's very hard to come up with something new. Mm-hmm. Um, every now and then someone comes up with something and you go, wow, that's a great idea. But to be able to sustain that for 50 years, you go, wow, wow, that's unfathomable. Um, so I, uh, I, I sort of, a year went by after I left the Tunesium and I thought, okay, um, I did a couple things. I did publish the Three Little Pigs Burgers. So I published my first book. That was a big first step. Hugely popular. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just signed a deal. Uh, the Heinz History Center has brought the rights to the Three Little Pigs Burgers. They're going to be producing it uh, through the Heinz History Center Press. Nice. So announced here first. So that, and, and, and um, that will be, I, I presume, featured in their gift shop down there, right? Yes, absolutely. And, It'll be featured in the gift shop, and they'll be distributing as well. So that's nice. great. So I did that. And then um, I decided uh, a year had passed. I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get syndicated. Um, I knew it was going to be tough. And I, so <laughs> one night, literally on a, on a Friday night, um, about, must've been about 1am. I woke up and I said, what can I do that no one else does? And I, I had always drawn mazes my whole life, these cartoon illustrated mazes. And I go, that's it. I'm going to try cartoon illustrated mazes. So I stayed up all night. I put together, I, I drew probably about 40 mazes in one night. Um, not exactly the right format. I, I, you know, I did them in color. They weren't, you know, I did okay, you know, Mm -hmm. put together the packet, the bio about me and everything and went online trying to find the, the, the syndicates, you know, get their addresses and I go, okay, all the syndicates want you to mail the packets out. I'll mail them out on Monday. I'll put together the packet and it's, it's now about, you know, 9am on Saturday morning. So, um, one syndicate creators, allowed online submissions. So I, I emailed to them. I sent it out to them Saturday morning and immediately regretted it. I thought, what have I done? These are, these are all wrong. I'm not ready. Um, and I contacted friends. I said, what have I done? Have I ruined my chances? They go, no, no, no. Everybody, everybody, their first time out, it's going to be, you know, eight weeks. You'll get a rejection letter. Don't worry about it. It's, it's no big deal. And then you regroup and submit again. I got an email on Monday from the syndicate. This is a day later saying, we love your work. We, we want to represent you. It was unbelievable. It doesn't happen that way. It does not happen that way. Um, within a month, uh, I had a contract and then, um, I was syndicated. you you were the one in a thousand. I, I was a one in a million. It was <laughs> just unbelievable. Um, but what I had was unique. Yeah. Um, now, since then, you know, to be honest, it, it is a long, slow process yeah. of getting into newspapers. You know, you're only in a handful of newspapers. You don't break out in, in 300 newspapers. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of time to build an audience. So, so I did that, and that was sort of the big thing, and that set everything off. I said, okay, if I can do this, I can do anything. Mm-hmm. So, um, you had the confidence well, enough to put that in, a, in the envelope and go. Like, and that's, yeah. that's all you needed. Yeah, and that, and that, that's it. I mean, ultimately, I say, you know, just... You have to get to a point in your life where you just go, okay, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do it. If it fails, it means I wasn't ready. But I needed to be told I wasn't ready so that I can continue to grow. If I succeed, then great. I've done it, you know. But I continue to grow. I continue to evolve. I continue to try new things. So, um, But that was a big first step. And then um, that sort of motivated me to say, okay, I've always wanted to do some some books. Uh, Maybe I'll see if I can get an agent. And uh, I got an agent and... Um, uh, we've done a couple of maze books and a couple other things. So, so that's sort of been the, the thing that really motivated me to keep moving forward. 
It was great stuff. I mean, you go to mazetunes.com, you can see see the work. Wow, these are, I love how detailed some of these are. Because this is what I think about is like, yeah, a little cartoon cat, but here's like uh, a Viking guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's super detailed. It's great. Yeah, yeah. And, and the dailies are, are about the size of a, a daily single panel. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're seeing up there, there's there's actually my tribute to Dick Brown, the creator of Hagar the Horrible for his, what would have been his 100th birthday. Uh, and I try and uh, do things around uh, around specific holidays. So mm-hmm. if it's Shark Week, there's sharks. If there's um, um, there's Mr. McFeely for um, I, I think that was uh, Postal Delivery Day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Cat Day, uh, you know, just different holidays and stuff. I'll tie in. And, uh, and I'm pulling up here. I uh, and this is you popping up in uh, or in this instance the Uniontown Herald Standard. Yeah, I'm, I'm now in the Uniontown Herald Center, which is the the closest we, I am in Pittsburgh, right between the Beetle Bailey and Doonesbury. I, so. I am in some very great uh, great location. There. That, is, that is great. That's awesome. So yeah, so it's it's a good spot. I know for me the kid that was, the, the thing that was too heady for me. Between the thing that was just right for me, <laughs> well, and, yeah, you know what's also funny is is they're really great. They um, traditionally funny pages have a header where it says the funnies or the comics page. You know, at the top of the page. Yeah, yeah. They actually used my art for their for their. So instead really? of Beetle Bailey and Snoopy or whatever, they actually pulled some of my art and, and asked if they could use that. And I said, Yeah, are you kidding? I'd, I'd love that. So. So they've been great to work with. Um, still working on getting into Pittsburgh. So you know, write your new, write the newspapers. You know, tell them you want them to carry Maze tunes. Local boy makes good. Let's you oh, know, yeah. I mean, get and, out there. And that's still well. One, there's one less newspaper. I don't know if the Trib has anything that has funny pages anymore. Yeah, the Trib still has funny pages. They do. Um, and and they run. You know, surprisingly, there you can still get the Trib in Penn Hills. You can okay, still get yeah, the Trib yeah. in in most of the area. So uh, certainly just, the trip's great. Just um, in the city. They, in the city, it's it's the primarily the Post Gazette in the city paper, mm-hmm. uh, or your two that are, that, are, that are sort of remaining here. So you know, in my mind, it seems like the perfect kind of one-off thing for a new uh, city paper too. Yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. that, and that's it. Just if you know, they call up Creator Syndicate, and say we want Maze Tunes. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So tell them to carry it. So you've been doing the books, yeah. Uh, uh, what's yeah. your reaction been to, to things like this, other than the syndicators themselves? It, it, it's been great. Um, the first book, Amazing Animals, um, uh, is by Barron's uh, Barron's Educational Books. Um, it's doing really well. Um, it is it is beautiful. It's it's fifty full color illustrated mazes, and um, they are just um, uh, just they they really just pop and they come alive. Um, and the book is at a low price point. I think it's it's um five ninety nine on Amazon. Five ninety nine on Amazon. Go get it now because that's a great <laughs> price. Um, uh, I think that's less than what I pay for them. But you can see, you know, there's some samples pages up on there. Um, it's a fun book. Uh, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, you know, when you tell you you're doing a book of, of fifty animals, you're like, okay, no problem. Um, and then you start drawing little scenes as you saw that one with the bear and, and everything. Wow. And so it's not just one animal in a scene. There might be, you know, 10 animals in a scene. And then I drew a rainforest that had like 20 animals in a scene. So there's, there's over 150 different animals in the book. If someone tells you name 50 animals, <laughs> I have found that about 35 is the, uh, the number on any given subject that people could name. Mm-hmm. So if you say name all fifty states, of course we know all fifty states. Everybody knows all fifty states. Sure you do, but you get to number thirty-five and you start to struggle because you know there's two Dakotas. You know you sort of think you throw off a little bit. Say name fifty animals. About thirty-five animals. You start. You've gone through dog and cat yeah, and like you're, animal. You're starting with marmoset. You're yeah. just you know just coming up with these things that. Anything you remember from your childhood, uh, you just start going to Australia. And three different getting, kinds of bears. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just running through. You start doing through dog species. Anything at all <laughs> that you can do. Um, the second book, uh, Myths and Monsters, just comes out. It's actually coming out on uh, this week on Saturday. Mm. I'll be appearing at the National Book Festival in Washington D.C. for the launch of the book. I'll be doing two performances. Um, just tremendously honored to be there. Myths and Monsters features myths and monsters. Uh, I pulled from folklore. I pulled from mythology. Um, the uh, Mothman from West Virginia is in the book. 
Um, you know, you've got um, uh, uh, Cthulhu is in the book. You've got um, mummies and zombies. Um, but then you've got, uh, you know, uh, Baba Yaga from uh, Russian folklore. So there's, you know, 50 of these myths and monsters. And uh, that was another one. Just, just great fun. That's amazing. Where can I get an awesome wardrobe like yours? <laughs> I, this is my shirt, custom made. Uh, I do awesome. have. I, I have a couple of these made shirts. I'm, I'm going to start producing these though because I I get a lot of people who request them. So. For, for those uh, on audio version of this, it's one of his biggest tunes. It's like, is it an actual? Like, it's maze it's, tune it's the Alice kinda... in Wonderland. So this is the nice. uh, Cheshire Cat. Uh, it's from one of my mazes, so it's a zoom in of that of that particular image. That's great. So I look at these and like you know look at these books. It's like I don't want to draw on the maze, <laughs> you know. And I, you, and I feel like the, the kids, right? They're going to be like, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and 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 they are. They're interactive. Mazes are the original interactive art form, right? You know, they're one of the earliest uh, and and ancient. It's an ancient art, uh, the art of mazes and labyrinths. Um, but it, they are works of art. And and I've had people say I bought the book and then I and then I framed them. I cut them out and I framed them. I, that's mm-hmm. great, but mm-hmm. let your kids solve them. That's buy two; they're cheap. Yeah, absolutely. You know? that's, absolutely. <laughs> buy two. The other thing I've said is I've had libraries buy them and have um, gotten little sheets of plastic and wipe off markers, there and you then are. they let kids just put the you know the sheet in and then use a wipe off marker on the book. That's, that's so genius. so that works great too. So wow. But so uh, so like you're at this point where this this book is getting around it can be like the thing that the kids like we were talking about uh, on awesome cast this week like there's a ar of the hung very hungry caterpillar and i was like and, and everyone's like i don't know this and my kid loves it and i'm like i read that when i was a kid yeah, yeah. you know like somebody maze, t- maze tunes could be their very hungry caterpillar book i you know what's funny is is maze tunes for me the maze books especially are are a throwback to my childhood in the seventies, there, there was a, a maze phenomenon uh, mm-hmm. occurring in the United States. And, um, I read games magazine all the time and dynamite and Humpty Dumpty, all these magazines had mazes in them, uh, highlights magazine. Um, mm-hmm. and so it was just this phenomenon and then it sort of faded. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm, I'm sort of at the forefront of sort of bringing back the maze, maze movement. Um, and, and that's my hope is that we reintroduce mazes because, we love gaming. We know gaming is so, so much fun, so important. Um, this then takes art and gaming and, and all these ideas and sort of brings them together again. It's it's wonderful uh, for your, for improving you know cognitive skills. It's wonderful for performing you know improving hand eye coordination. It's it's just a wonderful skill and it and it's so much fun because it's a challenge, um, but it's it's rewarding mm-hmm. because you 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 solve the maze. It's an accomplishment. Now, come and think of it, I think one of my favorite books from the library, there were two Pac-Man children's books that had mazes in yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be the thing I would get. Well, I mean, I mean, mazes are sort of for the foundation for so many video games. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's, it's, it is, it's, it's sort of this earliest form of, of gaming is, mm-hmm. is mazes. That's yeah. awesome. So uh, if people want to check you out, if people want to pick up the books, people want to bug their local uh, uh, paper to start carrying you, uh, you know, where do they start? Okay, so so first, bug your local uh, paper to start carrying me. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh, just straight up bug them. Just, just, just straight up, phone, you know, letter. Start calling, emailing, write letters, tweet, whatever you got to do. Uh, let the PG know, and I'm sure you have national listeners. Hey, wherever you are, um, <laughs> tell your local newspaper. I I know uh, I got the visit um, out in Missouri. Jefferson City, Missouri carries May's tunes. Mm-hmm. They invited me out. I did a show at the library there. Um, it's great. You know, meeting, you know, having kids come up with a clipping for the newspaper and say, will you sign this? Like, I did that. That's great. Wow. Uh, so do that. Um, the books, um, Amazon.com, but support your local bookstores. Uh, Penguin Books uh, and so Wickley carries it. Um, you should be able to get it at any of your local bookstores. If they don't have it, they can order it. Um, you know, it is distributed nationwide. Um, I'm sort of amazed. It's, it's, it's this amazing feeling when I travel to go into a bookstore in New York City and to see your book there on the shelf, you know, it's, 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 it's a great feeling. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, a childhood goal, goal you know, That's amazing. come alive. It's amazing to me. Amazing. Quite literally. I guess a lesson, lesson here is, is, is whatever it is you're trying to do, go for it. Take a shot, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, and, and the advice I always give is practice being lucky, mm-hmm. have the skills, have the talent, but that last element of luck, you have no control over. Mm-hmm. So you have to practice for that moment when luck happens and you can make it all happen. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. 
but you don't know when the luck is just going to hit. And, you, and that's a part of it. But most important, have the skills, have the talent, um, do what you need to do to be the best at what you do, um, but be the best at it. And then when luck comes, you'll be ready. If you're doing it in front of, just by yourself, not get in front of people, that's just, you're not going to have an opportunity. No, you've, you've, you've got to, You've got to love what you do. You've mm. got to pour your heart into it. You have to practice it on a daily basis. Get really good at it. And then so that when the right people see you or the right moment happens, whatever it is, everything else is already there. Everything is, all the groundwork has been laid and you're ready to just hit the ground running and you're ready for it. So that, that's you know the advice I give is just be ready. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us here. Mazetunes.com. And just amazing awareness, but it's great to work with you on some projects and, and, uh, you know, you for the last geez, 10 years, is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> At been this a while point. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And you can check out all the great conversations we have, the awesome chats, more stuff like this around, you know, just awesome stuff happening. Podcasters, tech, just people making cool stuff uh, at awesomecast.com. Subscribe wherever you like to get your podcast or, or video or however you want it. And if there's anybody you think we should be talking to, hit us up at awesomecast on the Twitter, the Facebook page for awesomecast, uh, the Facebook group. We have a lot of great discussion in there. And uh, let us know and we'll track these people down. We get a lot of suggestions and we really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you to my awesome guest you've been my our audience our awesome audience have an awesome week this show is a member of the sorgatron media podcast network find out more at sorgatronmedia.com